And in the break, uh, a number of people asked about reincarnation. So I'd like to perhaps do a little bit of a chat with you about reincarnation. One thing we notice, uh, by the way, overseas, over in Australia is that most of our groups have a very even distribution of males and females. <laughs> and this group doesn't. And, uh, Feminine country. Uh, <laughs> 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 Can I make I did, I asked away when I got lost here and I asked away. <laughs> Can I make a suggestion to you ladies? To have a look at those male emotions. Because that's what keeps the men away. Oh. <laughs> because uh, the truth is that the divine truth is very logical and, and appeals to both genders pretty much evenly. And so if we have a group where there's a larger proportion of women than men, the women need to look at what emotions they have towards the men that would be keeping the men away. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that, uh, and that's part of the law of attraction. So uh, the men who have come obviously are braver men than the average. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's a good thing too, perhaps. But, uh, but the key is to allow yourself to look at the emotions. Because um, if you're on the divine love path, looking at the emotions is the core of why things happen. And if you can see why things are happening, then you can change them. And m many of us uh, re realize that, and many of you who have been on a, on a natural love path, maybe in the New Age movement, or even re religion generally, find that many men are not very attractive to those kind of paths. And one of the main reasons why is there's not a lot of logic in those paths and a lot of mysticism. And generally men are not as attracted to mysticism as women are. And so um, there are also some issues with regard to what happens when a group of a different gender get together. So for, in, for an example, if we imagine now we're all down the pub, where obviously there'd probably be a lot more men and pro possibly fewer women in, in, the, in the pub. And you can f often feel different emotions that cause that to be the way. Right? And it's the same whenever a group of people get together for any subject. There's always a group, a, a reason why the law of attraction is happening the way it is. So that's why I suggest to the ladies that are here to have a look at your law of attraction with men. What's going on with your interaction with men? And what feelings you have towards men? And that uh, might finish up then attracting men into your life and also into the uh, into more spiritual, noticing more spiritual things around you. Many women complain that men don't uh, are not as attracted to spirituality, and um, it's a sweeping generalisation. And it is a sweeping generalisation, and it's also not correct. <laughs> and the truth is that uh, both parts of the soul are attracted to God and to spiritual things. It's just that we're not attracted to things um, for different emotional reasons. And many men are not attracted to many paths because they don't have much logic in them, and many of the paths don't um, portray that they portray themselves to be something different than what they are. And a lot of women will put, put up with that for a period of time as long as they are getting something out of it personally, whereas a lot of men will notice that instantly and say, no, I don't want anything to do with this. So there's, there's all sorts of reasons why the different genders will put up with different things, and, and the key is to look at the law of attraction emotionally inside of ourselves. And that's why I suggest that. But let's uh, look at this issue of reincarnation because I've been asked some questions about that. Remember initially I said when the soul incarnates the first time, we've got, if you, if you think of it, of these so little souls, little baby souls that God has created, all of God's children, and those souls split, remember, into that too. The incarnation process is the separation of the two soul halves. And, of course, those two soul halves have bodies created for them. The spirit body and the material body. And the same applies, of course, to the other half of the soul at some point. Now, the incarnation process at the beginning um, is that this soul is not conscious of itself. Uh, so in other words, it doesn't know itself. 
if it doesn't know itself, then it's obviously also not conscious of its own free will. So it doesn't know that it's able to do different things. It hasn't learned that yet. So it's not self-aware. You can think of it like a blank slate with a personality. So, so while it has personality, it certainly does have personality, as I write that down, it has personality. Because every single personality, every single soul God's created, every single child of God has a different personality. So of all the billions and millions and millions and millions of souls that have been created, there's not two that are alike. And when I say alike, identical to each other. So many of us have similarities, but we're not identical in nature. Now, to actually, the, the reason why we incarnate is to gain a consciousness of self, and to gain self-awareness, and to gain an idea of how to exercise our free will. So at that point, we don't exercise free will. We, you could say we have no free will, really, at that point, because... How can you have free will if you don't know how to use it? It's only when you know how to use it that you can have it. And so, because we're not conscious of ourselves, we're also not conscious that we have a free will at that point. So, we're not conscious of self, not aware of ourselves. We have a personality that God's inbuilt in us, which is very, very unique, not a single other person the same. But we don't know how to exercise our free will because we've never done it. And we've never learned how to do it. So what God did was create uh, also this process, which I would call incarnation. So this is the first time you ever visited the earth I'm talking about. Does that make sense? The very first time you ever come to earth, you incarnate. It's not a reincarnation because you've never done it before. Does that make sense? So you've never done it before, this is the first time. So in this first time what happens is you straight away, as soon as you... As soon as you connect to these physical and spiritual bodies that have been created through the sex act for you to connect to, as soon as you connect to them from now on, you are absorbing all of your experiences through these bodies. So you are now starting the process of becoming self-aware. So from the moment of conception onwards, you are basically becoming self-aware. And that's why a person can miscarry and still be like in the state that they have incarnated. And the process of incarnation causes you to, what I could call, individualize. Individualize. What I mean by that is that from that point on, you are now conscious that you are an individual very different to every other individual in the sense that you're starting to become aware that you have your own personality, your own nature and everything else. So the process of incarnation is there to cause you to become aware of your own individualization. Does that make sense? That's the process of incarnation. Once you incarnate, the moment you've incarnated, you've completed that process, basically, the beginning of that process, which is you are now an individual soul connected to a spirit form and a material form. So even if you miscarry at this point, you are still individualized from that moment onwards. Now, what happens in time? That's the process of incarnation. Now let's talk about the process of reincarnation. So remember, incarnation is the first time. Now, to reincarnate, there's a common belief that what happens is that you pass over into the spirit world and that you, uh, you have sort of like a life review, like some, some kind of thing that goes over your life and says, yeah, you didn't do that very well. You have, in other words, you have some karmic stuff to deal with now because of what you chose to do in your life. And then to do with that karma, there's this common viewpoint that you've got to reincarnate to now work your way through what you did the last time that wasn't very good. Right? And I'm going to put to you that that's all incorrect. 
and instead I present you with something else that remember these are all dimensions. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And we'll draw a heap of more up there to twenty-two. So we've got twenty-two up there. Okay, remember we said in our previous discussion that above the sixth there was sort of a barrier that you couldn't go over unless you progressed with divine love entering your soul. And there's another barrier, which is above the seventh, which is the barrier that is called the, when you move into being at one with God. What does at one with God mean? It means that every one of your emotions is now harmonious with what God's emotion would be about that particular thing. Not as powerful as God's emotions, but it's harmonious with God's emotions about that thing. So, so your emotions about animals are exactly the same as God's emotions about animals. Your emotions about birds, your emotions about creatures, your emotions about people, your emotions about sex, your emotions about love, your emotions... All of those emotions are all harmonious with what God's emotions are about that, that particular thing. And you've heard of the term being Christed? That happens in this transition. You've heard of the term of the new birth or being born again? That also is the same thing that happens at that transition. They're all the same thing. This process where the soul is born again in the sense that it's now at one with God in all of its desires and, and longings. That doesn't mean that it has the same longings and desires as God. It just means that every one of its longings are harmonious with God's love. So is this the Christ consciousness? This is what is real Christ consciousness. Real Christ consciousness. Yeah. Unfortunately, what's often presented on the earth as Christ consciousness is actually the sixth fear perfection. So that, remember the sixth fear one was natural love development? And often that's presented as if it's Christ consciousness. And many people on earth and also in the spirit world believe that location is Christ consciousness, and it's not. Christ consciousness begins in the eighth dimension, <coughs> and, it, uh, and it's at this time after you've gone into a one moment with God. There's an interesting connection you talked about the Hindus before, the, the name for God is Ram. <coughs> Krishna is actually Christ. They go, Hare Krishna, Rama, Rama. Christ is the Lamb of God, and they are Lamb of the Ram. It's the same concept. Krishna is Christ. Yeah, but I, I don't believe that Christ is God, though. So, because Christ is a condition rather than actually a person. Do you follow me? And, and Jesus, and by the way, I, um, I am Jesus, so Jesus was the first person in the first century to enter that condition. Right? And when I entered that, first, that condition first, that dimension was created. That's very challenging for some of you, isn't it? <laughs> so that condition was created. and that's, So I was the first person Christed, but I'm not the last, and will never be the last person Christed. Because every single person on the planet is able to be Christed, in the sense that you become at one with God in this location. So did you become, as, as Jesus in the first century, did you become Christ when you were baptised by John? Or when no. the said that the Christ came, or the Christ consciousness came, comes over him in the baptism? No, it happened through a period of my life where I slowly developed, just like you will need to do. Yep. And what happened is I, I started to develop very, very young in my first century life. And I went through lots of different emotional experiences like you were going through. But always connecting to God and always, you know, focusing on God and receiving divine love. And as I went through that transition, eventually, when I was 31 years of age, I went through this transition of becoming of one with God. And once I had gone through that transition, I went to my cousin John, and and I want I want the only reason why I got baptized is I wanted to. It was like a, my own symbol to myself, if you like. It was a very private thing for me. That, and I, I, I sort of sometimes now regret that I made that choice because of what people have done with baptism. But, but the truth is that the actual physical act of baptism meant nothing, really. Aside from a note, just a, me marking a, a sort of like a celebration of my own transformation. So before then, I was in, the, I was in this state of, in these spheres, slowly progressing. 
And then I went through this transformation in the seventh and eighth sphere, which became at one with God. So and the concept of a cosmic Christ, how does that fit? The well, scenario? there, in my opinion, is no, no such thing as a cosmic Christ. Oh, okay. And the, 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 the truth is I've experienced it through my life in the first century and in the spirit world and now, is that as you progress through in, in love, you get to this transformational place and when the transformational place occurs, you now know that everything that you do will be harmonious with God's love. And it's impossible for you, in fact, to not do anything harmonious with God's love in that state. And that's once you're in that state, you can continue progressing. And I continued to progress in the first century till the tenth dimension. And I died when I was in the tenth, in the tenth dimensional space or the tenth sphere of the spirit world. But on Earth, you can progress on Earth all through these locations. Right. And then you progress beyond the tenth sphere, and when you yes, it took me it took me two thousand years to progress from the tenth sphere to the twenty second sphere location. Yeah. So that took me two thousand years, nearly. So the Holy Spirit is the spirit body, is it? Or no, is the Holy Spirit. Um, I'll, I'll define the Holy Spirit separately for you. The Holy Spirit is the mechanism by which you receive divine love. So the Holy Spirit is like, you can think of it like a power cord. You know how you've got an electrical device like a toaster or something like that? Let's say you're the toaster. <laughs> and then you've got the, you've got the power station that's actually hundreds of miles away from you. Yeah. right? And you can power up this toaster only by connecting in the cord and turning on the, turning on the switch, right? And it's very much the same with your connection with God. When you plug into God, the way you plug into God is by longing for God's love to enter you. That's the plug. When you long for God's love to enter you, the Holy Spirit is like a power cord that actually physically connects into your soul. And when it connects into your soul, the divine love, God's love, will flow into your soul and you'll feel that happen. Every time that happens, you'll feel it happen. And if you don't feel it happen, it's not happening. Every time it happens, you will feel it happening. And the, the reason why it happens is when we're in harmony with God's truth. So as long as we're in harmony with God's truth and we have a longing for God's love to flow into our soul, we will actually receive more divine love. And so the Holy Spirit is this unique power connector, if you like, unique in the sense that no other spirit of God is the same. And God has many spirits or many active forces that God uses one of them is the active force of creation, for example. Another one is the active force of maintenance of the universe and so forth. God has many spirits, but the Holy Spirit is a specific connector that God uses to connect to you as her child. And it's only via that connection that divine love will flow. So when I asked God into my life, it was like a whole, a whole fire which went off in my head. Spot on, yeah. So there's a head, head involved. And that, that will actually, if you deal with different emotions that are blocking that, that will, state will happen 24 by 7. You can actually be in that state your entire life. So when you reach at one with God, you will be in that state you described all the time, not just sort of having a, one instance here and one instance there. And the only reason why that doesn't happen is because of the blockages we have to that happening. Yeah, the emotional blockages. And, and not just emotional blockages, there can be emotional beliefs as well, like belief systems that we have and so forth, that prevent the divine life from flowing. For example, if I believe God is an is a, is a energy rather than an entity, divine love will not flow into my soul until I believe that God's an entity. Here. Right. Your, body, <coughs> sorry, your body's a temple of the Holy Spirit. Your nature's social, physical intellectual, emotional and spiritual, where really use the spirit in you. So in the most basic, intimate sense, your body, man or woman, is the church that God created. It's all about relationship. So yeah, so I, I can't agree with that. I feel the soul is. And the body is just the body is just one of the tools by which the soul expresses itself. So where, so, where does the soul dwell? The soul is actually, right now, your soul surrounds both of your bodies. So it, you can think of it as a, like a, almost like a third body. It's an, it's, you are a half of one, actually, not a complete one. And around you, there is a, there's this, um, this auric field, if you like, that is your soul. And it contains both of your bodies, both your spirit form 
annual material form. What I believe is when your physical body dies, your spirit leaves your body and goes up to the atmosphere, hence the ghost angels and demons. And there's this invisible spiritual realm around us, which most of us can't discern. Now, when Christ comes again, again which is I think is going to be soon as we think of what's happening in the world, he's going to judge the living and the dead. You're going to look back on that statement and. <laughs> <laughs> So, so, just on that note, is the Christ and Jesus two separate? Entities? Yes. Yes, that's what. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Myself, I am Jesus. Like, and Christ is a separate entity. Yes, uh, not an entity. Or a separate condition. Yes, condition. condition. And when you when you be, when you enter the statement of at one with God, you will become Christ too. Does that make sense? Christ, yeah. I, yeah, you'll become Christ too. Yeah. And the reason why I'm often referred to as Jesus Christ is because I was just the first one to enter that state. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's all. Yeah. But every single person on the planet, every single person in the spirit world, is able to enter that state. Mm -hmm. yeah. There's a statement in the Bible that says, anything I can do, you can do too, and more so. Exactly. And I purposely stated that statement yeah. to indicate that actually... It's not about me as an individual, it's about what I'm, you know, what I was illustrating, which is this aspect of being Christ. But can I, can I continue with the discussion with reincarnation? Yeah. 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 Okay, so, so what, the reason why I pointed out this process is because <coughs> we're basically progressing through these spheres, right? These dimensional spaces, which we can do while we're on Earth. We can do it anywhere we, we want. So we're progressing. And we're progressing, remember, we can't progress beyond the sixth year if we're progressing just in our own love. We can process, progress above that. Now, you notice right at the beginning when we're incarnated, when we first incarnated, the soul was together and it had to split in two to incarnate. Right? Now, what's going to happen to reincarnate is the soul has to recombine before it can split in two again. Because remember, this is a half of the soul at the moment progressing with a body, and this other half is progressing with a different body right, all the way through. So, so myself and my soulmate have to enter the same state in order to reincarnate. Right? And that only occurs when the soul actually recombines, and that can only occur, and this is why it took um, 2,000 years for me to come back, right, is because all of that time, we were progressing through these dimensional existences to the point there. And then when we recombine into that place, now we can actually return. So the truth is that there is, and this has been my experience uh, in terms of what I remember, the truth is that there was no big, like as soon as I passed, I had a life review. I didn't, that never happened to me, nor did it happen to the most of my friends who have passed. And when I say most of them, all of them have never happened to and what I did was I had to continue to progress and when I passed, I passed into the 10th dimension because I was already at one with God and I progressed a bit more with different truths and then I progressed through to the 22nd dimension and my soulmate, Mary Magdalene, had to do the same thing and she progressed into the 22nd dimension and once we both progressed into there, we could reunite and once we reunited, we could choose to return. But you don't come back to deal with karmic issues. Because what are you doing as you're progressing? Aren't you dealing with issues all the way through? So if you speak to spirits, what you'll find is, and you ask them really deep questions about this stuff, what you'll find is that every spirit that ever comes to you that talks about reincarnation has not personally experienced it. Every single spirit I've ever asked, have you personally experienced reincarnation? The answer has always been if they're in an old state, which usually they are by the time they reach the second sphere. Every one of them has said no, they have not personally experienced it, they've just heard about it from others. There was some research done by a chap called Ian Stevenson from the University of Virginia. Yep. Um, which seems to suggest fairly solidly in um, point to reincarnation. Well, let's look at the suggestions he makes, shall we? <laughs> because it's very important to understand what's really going on. There's usually five or six different reasons why a person believes in reincarnation. Right? 
And uh, besides there being just a religious dogma, I mean. Most of the reasons relate to personal experience right, that people have had, where they felt like they were another person from another life. Does that make sense? So let me say, let's say this here. This is me. Now I have going through my my mind pictures of a different life, like maybe 300 years ago, let's say. Uh, a life when I might have been, who lived 300 years ago? <laughs> Captain Cook? Okay, let's go for Captain Cook. Right. So let's say I have pictures going through my mind of a life lived 300 years ago and as Captain Cook. Later, um, when people watch this DVD around the world, they'll wonder who the hell Captain Cook was. <laughs> <laughs> he was a man who so called discovered. You could make it Captain Hook. Captain Hook. <laughs> <laughs> now, 300 years ago or so, Captain Cook died. And he became a spirit. He has a spirit body and a soul. And he's living in the spirit world. Right? And what happens is, because of the law of attraction, there's different things that he's going to be attracted to different people on earth about. right? And he will come to the person on earth to visit them, for whatever reason. If the person, for example, is interested in discovering new things, Captain Cook might be attracted to him, right? because that was his, he was interested. If the person was a, 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 a a, a captain of a ship that he might attract Captain Cook to his life as well. There's all sorts of reasons why this man in the spirit world may be attracted to this person. This man still exists in the spirit world, is what I'm saying. He's not me, I'm not reincarnation of him, he's still there. And what happens is when he is attracted to me, he gives me pictures, thoughts, and emotions of his life. And he is perfectly able to communicate with me in this manner as I am with you. Just because you've got a spirit body, it makes no difference. You're still capable of communication. So this Captain Cook can come to me and he can give me pictures, thoughts and emotions about his life. Now, doesn't my belief really determine how I'm going to interpret that? If I believe in reincarnation, I'm going to go down the track of thinking, Wow, maybe I'm the reincarnation of Captain Cook. <laughs> right? Might not. But if I feel that actually the spirit's still in the spirit world, I can say, Wow, Captain Cook's here to visit me. Let's have a chat with him. Now, if, if you're a medium and you take the second road of having a chat with this person, you'll find that they'll be able to tell you a lot more than what they've just told you through the pictures, thoughts and emotions they've given you. And so my suggestion to anybody who wants to experiment with this is to actually allow themselves to communicate to the person who's with them as if they're communicating to a person on earth. Rather than just accepting that all those pictures and all those thoughts and all those experiences are my own. Because the truth is they might not be your own. They might be a spirit in the spirit world who's just giving you those pictures. And the truth is that many spirits want to do that. The reason why they want to do that are very, like there's very many reasons. One reason is that Captain Cook, for example, sometimes killed quite a few different people, who his orders did, killed quite a few different people. Because of, you know, when he met, went onto a native land and there was a bit of a war between that and, you know, before you know it, some of his people with him, the soldiers and so forth, killing others. And, and, and none of that's very well documented, of course, because we don't <coughs> like to think about all those things. In terms of, in terms of our history, but the reality is that many people from the past were involved in murderous acts, and many people in the past were involved with many other acts that were not very moral, and that actually keeps them in the first or in the first sphere of the spirit world. Does that make sense? It keeps them in the first sphere. If I can just continue in, in my explanation, but that keeps them in the first sphere. Now, in that first sphere place. They are often going to be locked up in that place until they learn to work through their morals and emotions. Now, now imagine you're a spirit. You're running around in the first fear. When I say running around, it's like it's instantaneous like movement. 
and you're in the first sphere, and then you're re-attracted to Earth quite a lot as well, right? Because that's where the life began, so you go back to Earth quite a lot. Now imagine for a moment that you can go along to a person who can talk to other spirit, to spirits, and they're on the Earth. So you call them a medium or a psychic, right? But as a spirit, all I'm saying, well, they can talk to me. They can hear me as well. What would you be tempted to do if you felt you weren't listened to in the spirit world very much? You'd be very tempted, wouldn't you, to go and talk to that person quite frequently. Now, if that person, let's say that person's me, and I'm getting talked to quite frequently about Captain Cook, Captain Cook's life and everything else, and I have this belief in reincarnation, I'm automatically going to assume that that was one of my past lives. But I might not consider the alternatives. And the alternatives are quite a lot of alternatives. There's the alternative, actually, that Captain Cook is visiting me and telling me about his past life that he had on Earth. And I could actually ask him, if I, would, if I was open communicating with spirits, I could ask him more about his life, his life now in the spirit world, how he's finding it, all these other things. But because I think that I'm this person reincarnated, do I think to ask those questions? No, of course not. What I finish up doing is I just assume that this person has to be a reincarnate, might on the reincarnation of them, and I make a lot of then very big assumptions based on that one primary assumption, when in reality it could be something totally different and, and a lot more logical going on. Does that make sense? Now, imagine for a moment that I've got lots of these spirits around me, and the more mediumistic I am, uh, sorry about the skirt, but it's like, the more mediumistic I am, the more spirits I will have surrounding me wanting to talk to me at any one time. Now, if I believe in reincarnation, I'm going to then believe that I was that person at some time, I was that person in some time, I was that person at some time, and I can recollect many of the events. But one thing that's really important to notice with all of this is that many of the events are usually that I can recollect are either important events in their life or their death. And there's a reason for that. Because many of these spirits are in total confusion about their death. And they don't know what to do about that. They don't know what to what actions they should take, why they are, where they are, lots of different things. And I've talked to literally hundreds of thousands of spirits in those locations. In, while I've been alive here on Earth, who firstly come to me and start thinking that they had to reincarnate before they could progress. So they, they actually believed they had to come back to Earth somehow before they can progress further. And I'm saying to them, no, 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 you don't have to do that. These dimensions are all dimensions of love and all you need to do is begin progressing in love and you will get out of where you are and into a different state. That's all you need to do. And when they start doing that, the changes in them are quite rapid and, 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 uh, and very, very clear. So as a soul, you can progress through the dimensions without... You do not have to return to Earth. Yeah. You've got to design it that way. Yeah. And when you think about it, what is loving anyway? Is it loving for a person to return to Earth, not have a recollection of their previous life, but have a heap of karma to deal with about their previous life? Is that loving? Not really, is it? Would you do that to your child? Would you go, would you give your child a spank, like today, and then tomorrow give them a spank for the same thing, and a spank the next day for the same thing? If you think about it, that's really what's happening. Would you give them a spank for the same thing without telling them what it was about? Would you do that? Of course you wouldn't. You would design a system where the person can learn what it's about, what the emotion is about. But what God designed actually is the most loving possible system, and that is at any one time you can find out how harmonious with love you are or not. That's what God designed. Now, the reincarnation teachings actually say the opposite when you think about it. What they're saying is you reincarnate to work through a previous life karma, but you don't know what the karma was. You don't know what the error was that you've got to work through. So how are you going to work through it if you don't know what it is? Is that fair? Surely you should be told right at the beginning, right? And this is where people invented the, you know, the, the life 
review that. The reason why they invented that, because they felt that it wasn't fair what, what the original teaching was. And the original teaching was actually quite simple. When I breath, the original teaching was when I breathe my last breath, I then enter the next child. I then become the next child born. That was the original teaching in its really basic premise. And then reincarnation teachings have been modified since then, and modified and modified to suit a lot of intellectual stuff. But in the end, they all come from this basic premise, and that is that I cannot grow without returning to earth. And it's totally incorrect. The truth is I've seen many, many spirits grow from these locations to higher locations without ever coming to earth. And in fact, the truth is also that I've seen many of these spirits locked up, connected to a person on earth, believing they have to be there to progress and actually harming themselves even further. I've seen people connected to a person on earth for hundreds of years, you know, one person after another person after another person for hundreds of years. And keeping themselves on those And keeping the themselves in the first dimensional space for hundreds and hundreds of years with that belief. Um, now, how do you explain the discrepancies of birth? Like people born into fortunate circumstances, people born into circumstances of deprivation, um, you know, all, all the inconsistencies on the planet that you can <coughs> in different situations you could be born into. Because uh, the philosophical understanding is that part of your karmic kind of lot, you know, um, from things you've done before, and also people who are born with um, disabilities. So how do you account for that if it's not... Are all the previous generation's choices of man's free will being worked out? Previous... Yep. You are a product right now. You are a product of the previous generation's choices. It's politics, basically, isn't it? Previous, not just politics, religion, yeah. belief systems, emotions, everything. You're the, you are the product of that. That's just another way of saying a generational curse. Is it something someone in your gene genealogy has done? Yep. As older than you being the way you are. That's correct. And that is dead right. There is this multi generational. What you could classify as sin, and if I define sin as missing the mark of perfection, missing you know, the mark of love, is this multi-generational sin that gets passed down generation upon generation upon generation because most of us are totally unwilling to deal with the emotional reasons why we're being unloving. And the emotional reasons why we're being unloving create all of our diseases, all of our problems. Every single one of the world's problems right at this moment is caused by a lack of love. Every single one of them. So when you ask me, why does a child born in Africa rather than here? Well, under God's situation, the way God created it, being born in Africa and born in here, you'd have just as many blessings. The way man creates it is we've set up this terrible economical system that causes the destruction of poorer countries for the sake of the rich. And because of that terrible environmental system, now when one person gets born in Africa, they have a terribly hard time and may die by the time they're five. In fact, 50 million of them do. Uh, every year, they die by the time they're five. And so why, why does that happen? Because we, collectively, choose to live out of harmony with love. That's what happens. No other reason. Because if we all collectively chose to live in harmony with love, we'd find there's enough food on the planet, there's enough wealth on the planet to, for every single person to survive. So if that soul's coming into incarnation, does it know the environment it's coming into? No, remember I said the soul does not know. It doesn't know. No, it's the parents who know. Okay. Parents are the ones who are alive on earth, and they're the ones who know, and they're the ones who attract that soul. See, see, the New Age viewpoint is that the little soul attracts the parents, or it chooses the parents. Mm. My the truth that I've seen in my life is that actually the parents attract the little child mm -hmm. in order to work through a lot of their unhealed emotion. Okay. And the parents are the ones who are making the conscious choice, even though when I say conscious, it's a soul-based choice. So if a child's born with a disability, then the soul will attract the child with disabilities? It's unhealed parental emotions based upon man's free will. Yes, always. Okay. So unhealed parental emotions. Yeah. So the key of healing any of these things, firstly, is understanding where they came from. The problem is, is that most of us go, oh, AJ's now saying the parents are to blame. Oh, isn't he being terrible? No, I'm just being truthful. And my emotional response to that might mean, might mean that I'm upset. But if I'm upset, then it's because of emotion inside of myself that I'm upset. 
The truth is, if I heal every emotion inside of myself before I have a child, my child will be born perfect, and everything that it does will be so easy for it to assimilate. It might not be at one with God, but it will certainly be perfect in natural love, and everything that happens to it will be perfect in, a, in, a, in itself, and, and will be, its life will be quite blissful. But the truth is, because I have a whole group of unhealed emotions inside of me, and I go along and have a child now, now my child, through the law of attraction and through what's happening at the time of conception, so here's my soul, at the time of conception, the parents and environment's emotions are being absorbed by that soul, right at the time that it's conceived. So now it's absorbing all of this stuff, all of this crap from the environment, if you like, that's unloving, is going into this soul. Plus there's some loving things going into it too, of course. It just depends what's in its environment, right? But all of these things are going into the soul of that child. And as a result of that, that child will pay the penalty of all of those emotions entering it at some point in its life. When I say pay the penalty, it's not the child to blame for it, <coughs> but the child is paying the price of us not choosing to deal with our emotions and release them and get over them so that, so that our child can have a free life without those emotions. And because it's unhealed within the family, it just gets passed on. Exactly. And the child within that family decides that enough's enough and they're going to break the cycle. Yeah, and look what happens when you try to break the cycle. They all hell breaks loose, right? <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. You're a mother in Somalia and you've got, you know, they're sort of trying to sort your family and your tribe or whatever. Yep. Um, so how can you possibly heal your emotions. You can't. Well, this is why people in the Western world need to start taking responsibility for what we've created. We've created the poverty in these other nations. You know how we've done it? You look at what happened to your country. What happened? About like 200 years ago, you had a whole heap of people come here and basically just rape the country. Right? Take as much as they could possibly take from it. Take as much from those people as they possibly could at the time. And they just can't, and this is what's happened over and over again, isn't it? Like, it's only just one point of view, by the way. Well, well, no, it's one point of view, but it's happened. These things have happened in every single country that Western people have conquered. Yeah, that's right. there, there is a total. Well, at the moment, do, do, does New Zealand produce its own oil? Yeah. 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 yeah, we produce oil. Yeah. Do you produce your own oil to the amount that you could look after yes. your own we do. place? No. Do you produce all of your own food? We could. No, you could. <laughs> That's not the point. You told yourself <laughs> Yes, I know you could. But what happens in most Western countries is totally different, isn't it? Yeah. What happens is you farm out your cotton, your wool, or whatever. It goes over to Asia somewhere. Some some little person in a backyard place getting paid two dollars a month makes a woolen jacket that gets sent back to here to... And why does that happen? Because it's cheaper than somebody else here getting paid a proper wage that can do it and I have to pay $150 for my jumper instead of $30. That's why it happens. It happens because we make the choice, we make the choice that because we're worried about money, we make the choice that we want everything cheaper and so then we make a lot of decisions that are disharmonious with love right in that moment. And we do not own it. You know, many of, many of you ladies have got diamonds, I noticed, right? But let's be honest about where they come from. Do you know where they come from? Have many of you seen the movie Blood Diamond? Most of you wouldn't even probably want to watch it. Right? But, but it's so confronting because the reason why we get to have these different things on our fingers and so forth is not because we're loving. We, we don't think about the results of what we're doing. Most of the time, we don't even consider the results of what we're doing. And in the Western world, we do not consider the results of what we're doing to the poorer countries. Mm -hmm. The truth is that, you know, the, most of you will be up, at, up in uproar about the Amazon being ripped out mm -hmm. a football field a minute, right? Mm -hmm. But the truth is, you know why it's happening? So that, we, so that they can grow beef to sell to the world. So it's happening because of people eating meat. That's why it's happening. But we don't want to own that. I want, I want to ask about genius. As I heard yesterday, I think it was that Chopin had put on his first concert when he was seven years old. Yep. How do we deal with that? Uh, it's really easy to, easy to see what's happening if you understand spirits as well. What's often happening with a person who's so-called child prodigy 
is firstly they're quite open and motion in one particular area. So they might be with music or with art or with some kind of engineering or something like that. And then a spirit who is well versed in that particular thing can educate that person. And almost all of their inspiration comes from the spirit world. So many of the songs that you hear play even now have actually come initially from the spirit world, from a person in the spirit world. And when this person passes, they recognise the connection of where they got their inspiration. This is why match inspiration for musicians comes while they are under the influence of drugs. Right? Or drink. Because you're, when you're under the influence of drug or drink, your mind is less involved in the process of communication with people that, are, that you can't see. And so what happens is you receive inspiration from people in the spirit world. So, so the Dalai Lama? The Dalai Lama is a person, there's a whole group, uh, I've spoken to some of them by the way, of spirits in the spirit world who were prior Dalai Lamas. If I can illustrate what happened, or what happens, it's quite easy to see what happens. You've got a whole string of Dalai Lamas in the spirit world who want to promote the Buddhist, Tibetan Buddhist faith, right? There are generations of them. They're all got certain... And what a core group of them, they're not all of them because some of them have progressed beyond this point, but what a core group of them still on the natural love path do is they actually choose the next most mediumistic person they can on earth who has the same belief system. And then from the moment they are born, they educate him up until generally the age of seven or to a teenager. It just depends on how long it takes for that education to occur. And then this person, of course, now takes on the persona of the Dalai Lama because these are all the previous Dalai Lama influencing that person. Is that considered an entity, those previous Dalai Lamas? No, they're all separate entities. They, they all know they're individuals. They know they are. Right? They, they get together and they do this to promote their faith on earth. Right? They feel they have very good reasons to do it. One of the big reasons is they want somebody, the next Dalai Lama, to be in a love space, what they feel is a natural love space, that he can teach love to the world. So that from their perspective, they have a pure motive. It's just that it, the truth of what's happening is not well known. So they're not progressing because they're not on, on a divine truth path in, in the spirit world? Yeah, well, they're not progressing because they are actually not stating the truth to this person. <coughs> That's why they're not progressing. Why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, because of their law of attraction with their soul condition. But can I just finish this discussion first? Um, so can you see what's happening? There's a group of people in the spirit world, all in a certain condition, all wanting to promote a certain faith on earth. So what, and by the way, this happens in every religion, not, not just in the Buddhist religion, or, or, but, but because the Buddhist and Hindu's faiths accept spirits much more than the Christian faith, it's much easier to, to do. So what they do is there's parents here, like there's two parents involved, who are so happy that their child is the next chosen Dalai Lama, right? And they are very, very happy about that. So mum and dad are very happy that our child is the next Dalai Lama. And they support this child absorbing all of this knowledge and information from the spirit world. The problem for these people is they can't progress while they, lock, while they present untruths to this person. Right? And some of the untruths are going to be like, for instance, I don't know if you know, but the Buddhist faith teaches basically that homosexuality is a sin. Right? It is. Well, I know you might feel that, but I don't. And, and, and I don't feel God feels that either. But, and I can prove it to you, because uh, one of my apostles in the first century was actually a homosexual. Uh, John. Apostle John. Right. John the Baptist. No, John. Son of that place. Right? So so the truth is that that these belief systems get imposed upon the earth through spirit connections. And and while the person on earth is accepting the belief system, of course they're going to absorb that belief system from spirits. And if they're highly mediumistic, which by the way, more and more children are becoming, you notice that? You notice in your own, in the, 
you can hear, like quite often we go out now and we hear little children say, oh, I've got this friend and that friend with me and this friend's riding a tiger and that friend's doing this. And, do you know what I mean? They, these little children are explaining what they're seeing at any one time and, uh, and very mediumistic because the more we deal with our own emotions, the more there is, a, there is less of a block between the spirit world and us. And as a result, we can feel and hear more, more and more. So, all he's doing, really, is absorbing all this information until such a point where he acts upon this information and then at that point these Dalai Lamas allow the next Dalai Lama to do his thing. And they still guide him, by the way, for the rest of his life. There he is, guys, for the rest of his life. AJ, um, just to change the subject, because we're sort of running out of time, a few people asked me to... Um, if you could explain how you deal with your emotions, how you get the emotions and go through the emotional block. Okay. <laughs> because I think a lot of us have that problem. Yeah, 10 minutes. Okay. <laughs> 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 no, no, it takes hours to explain. But. And yeah. I'll try to explain it as simply as I can in terms of an overview. Is that better, right? So here's me and my soul. So let's uh, start, there's me and my soul. So my soul, I'm half of a soul, remember, has all sorts of emotions and, and feelings involved with it. But generally there is a general chain of emotions that, that we could construct within ourselves that are that is constructed from our childhood onwards. The deepest emotions are grief and generally shame. Right? So, and then generally there's a lot of grief associated with shame. They are the deepest emotions within us. They are the emotions that the majority of the world has, wants nothing to do with. You know, this is why we go around saying, oh, don't cry, don't cry. Our little babies, they're crying, and what are we going? We're going, don't cry, don't cry, because we are so confronted by crying. <coughs> but we are also even more confronted by shame, aren't we? Like whenever you've been in a place where you've been personally shamed, doesn't that feel terrible? It like, just feels so, so terrible. So under the, over the top of that, we generally have fear. Fear of feeling those deeper emotions. Right? So pretty much all of our blockages to shame and grief are resulting around our fears that we have about them. So what is our, what is our fear about shame? Well, if I tell the truth about what I did when I was three... Like somebody might, you know, somebody might condemn me and think <coughs> think badly of me. And because I'm so afraid of them thinking badly of me, I don't even want to tell them the truth. What about grief? Why wouldn't we feel grief? Because do you need to tell them the truth if they don't know anything about it? Why not? Why wouldn't you? Well, why would you? Well, you see, this is what I'm saying. Why yeah, wouldn't you? Know. <laughs> so you're saying why would you? Tell why would you? If it doesn't come up. It's not going to come up. Well, I'm resistant. <laughs> of course, it's not going to come up. Right. Why can't I can be completely open with every single person about my life? Why can't I be? Because I am ashamed. And is shame going to prevent me from being at one with God? Yes. Why? Do you think God feels shame? No. So I'm going to have to release every shame that I have to be at one with God. Did you see that? So, but, 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 See where that mind goes. What are you going to do? You're going to run around sort of pouring yourself out to every single person you sort of meet? Of course no. not. No. It's all repentance. Of course not. But when you get to a point where you've dealt with your shame, you're not ashamed to say what your shame, what your shame was about. Do you understand? Like you talk just as freely about that issue as you would about any positive issue in your life. So look back over your conversations. And when the, let's, say, let's say a person comes up to you and says, oh, I had an abortion when I was 17. Right? And you flip back in your life and you go, wow, I had an abortion when I was 19. Right? But I won't say that. Right? A lot of times you won't say that until you're talking to a person who's had the same thing. Agree? You won't say it because you feel... Shame. You're worried about what the judgment is going to be and so forth. But if you had repented of that and healed of that inside of yourself emotionally, 
you'd be quite okay about saying about it, wouldn't you? So there's a situation that's come up. My law of attraction has brought me an event where I could easily talk about my own shame to help me and this person heal, but I choose to avoid it because I'm afraid. <coughs> so it's it is what it is, and it happened, and I'm allowed to speak about it, and in fact I need to, to get through these emotions. Yeah. But let's look what happens. Is that on top of the fear, we often put anger. So, I notice somebody had an abortion, I get angry. Why am I getting angry? Because I have an emotion inside of myself of judgment towards the person. Where does that come from? It comes from a denial of something inside of myself, a fear about something about my own life. It could be that I had a life where my mother was thinking about aborting me, and every time I hear of somebody getting aborted, I connect with this unhealed emotion inside of me that I don't want to feel. And so I get angry. Or it could be that every time somebody just reminds me of my own shame, I get angry. Right? Now, on top of the anger, so let's put anger, frustration is, is in there as well. Annoyance is in there as well. What about guilt? Because that's a big thing. People often feel guilty about uh, Guilt is usually related a to... shame. Okay. Yeah. Guilt. Yeah. It's yeah. different, but anyway. Yeah. Or, or guilt, guilt can be a fear as well, mm -hmm. in the it's, sense. If you can't change a situation or something that you feel... Would make that hurt. So Obviously. you did something wrong. Oh no, in the not past. even that. It's not even that. It's just that you can't change something, something to make something better for somebody else. And yeah. Sure well, that's an feel. emotion of grief too that you need to feel. Okay. Yeah. So if we look at, often we want to suppress our anger as well, right? So what do we do with that? We go into this numbed out, depressed state, right? How do you spell numb? Numb. Right. Go into this numb state. How do we actually get rid of all that as well? There's a way to get rid of all that as well that we construct. It's really, really clever, you know. We go all intellectual. <laughs> I don't feel any of those things. I'm over all of those things. I'm done with all those things. And yet our law of attraction is constantly bringing them to us in a day to day. <laughs> Are we opening? No, we're not, right? So, so if you can think of it as like, these are layers, if you like, within each person. They are layers of emotion. So the question was, how do I deal with my emotions? Right? You could say that these emotions are what we could call causal emotions. I'll just write that. Causal emotions. So causal, this em these emotions, are blocking. Oh, this sorry, this this emotion is block blocking. These emotions. And intellectual is all self deception. So anger is, is self deception. Yeah. Some people carry a lot of anger with them, don't they? I mean, um, everyone I've met has carried lots of anger with them. And yes, anger, anger is a way to get out of our feeling powerlessness. Okay. So it's a way to feel powerful. Why would we want to feel powerful? Because actually, at that moment, we're avoiding. Because we're afraid, we're avoiding our powerless state. These are powerless states, aren't they? That's what they feel like within us, actually. My opinion is, these are the most powerful emotions you can ever experience and release. They are the life-changing emotions. Shame and grief. Shame and grief. You get rid of those emotions and your whole life and your law of attraction will instantly change. The problem is, most of us avoid those emotions like the plague. Right? And instead, we live in these emotions, or in the intellect. Right? So we live in this place because we want to avoid this place. Mm -hmm. Now, the way your soul is constructed is, if you don't feel these places, you won't release them. So you can't bypass 
fear in order to get to grief. You can't bypass anger in order to get to fear. You actually have to experience it to get through it to get to the next path. So if I'm angry a lot, I am going to have to now deal with my anger in an appropriate manner, which is not, by the way, yelling and screaming at your partner, right? but rather getting out maybe with a bag or the thing and bashing and just connecting to the internal rage and experiencing it. And as I'm experiencing it, the, th the thing that I'm angry about, which is some fear underneath generally, or an expectation that I have of somebody else, it could be, the fear is exposed. And then I go from a person who's angry all the time to a person who's afraid all the time. Does that make sense? That's great. That's progression. Right? But a lot of us don't feel that's progression. We go into this mind place of, no, that's not progression. But that's progression. And then when I start feeling my fears and my terrors, I start realising what I'm actually afraid of. And what I'm afraid of, you'll find, always has grief and shame generally attached to it. Right? And I'm afraid of feeling those feelings. And once I acknowledge that and feel my fear of that, now I'll start experiencing those emotions. So I'll experience shame. Shame, depending on what type of shame, feels like hot waves coming over you. Many of you ladies have this during menopause, do you know? The reason why is there's lots of shameful things that have happened in your life that are coming out during the process of menopause. Do you understand? Stuff that's been suppressed through your life that now is being experienced physically. Is menstruation actually a natural process? No. Is that clear enough answer? <laughs> no, menstruation is the same as many other processes, and that is that it's caused by the damage that's in our soul affecting the way our body works. Mm -hmm. right? The truth is your body is totally capable of absorbing all, all of the, the fluids and, and matter that has been produced ready for a baby. And also, your body is totally capable of only becoming ready for a baby when you want to get pregnant. The truth is, for most women, most women want to get pregnant all the time. Because there is some very big human emotions about what defines a woman. And many women don't feel like they're a woman until they've had a child. Does that make sense? And that's, that's something that comes very early in age, and so many women are constantly like preparing for a child, preparing for a child, preparing for a child, preparing for a child, because there's this emotion in them, I'm not a woman until I have one. Uh, the truth is your body is totally capable of not having that happen on a monthly basis, and totally capable of only having it happen when you want to have a child. Something to think about anyway. <laughs> Adrian, speak just quickly, um, yep. the dimensions or your spheres between them, you always stop at 22. Is that is just because that's as high as you went, or that's as high as anyone's been at the moment? Right. But that, there will be more dimensions above that. In my my feelings are there are more above that. Mm -hmm. It's just that nobody's got to them yet, because there's whole new truths that need to be accepted before you can get to each new dimension. So so remember, progression on the divine love path is infinite, not limited to numbers. numbers but that's a, a soul that's linked to the human experience as opposed to a celestial No, a celestial being. being is a soul between the seventh, between the eighth sphere and the twenty-second. Okay. And when you enter the twenty-second state, you are now in the soul union state, where you, self, and your soul mate are one again. And in that state, my feelings are, and it hasn't happened yet, but my feelings are, that you can be taught many other things that you haven't learned. And there's a whole new dimension. There's a whole new dimension. <coughs> to learn. All of that, all above there. So you can think of the 22nd state, the sphere state in that soul union place, as like being like a baby, ready to be learning things in a whole new dimensional existence. So 8 22nd is where the celestial beings. That's right. All the celestial beings that are referred to on Earth, they come from the celestial spheres, <coughs> which are the eight sphere onwards. They progressed from the first and from Earth, all of them. So you know how you know, like you've heard of Angel Michael, Archangel Michael Gabriel, and all those ones. They all lived on the Earth at some point, and uh, and they all had an Earth experience that you can discuss with them about. And they also have progressed 
on the divine love path, those two in particular. There are others that haven't progressed on the divine love path. So Buddha and Muhammad both have not progressed on the divine love path. They've, they're still on the natural love path, they're in the sixth sphere, and they have not progressed on the divine love path at this point. But some of their followers have. So Gandhi, for example, has progressed on the divine love path, and I think he's in the 19th sphere at the moment. So, so it's just like, it just depends on, on the person wanting to do this connection with God and, and whether they want to progress in that manner. That's all it depends on. Just on that note, yeah. and it's come up in discussion, you must have a lot of esoteric and occult knowledge that you're not actually yet sharing with people. That's correct. Yeah, must have. <laughs> <laughs> the two have gone that high. Yes. And, and so the reason... Why, you're with the emotional... Well, the reason why I don't want to share it at this point is because it is pointless sharing that information if the people, people don't get the basics. And the basic is you developing in love. That's, that's what I want to emphasise. That's the basic part of progression. If, if, you, if you don't get that basic part of progression, all the esoteric knowledge in the world will not benefit you when you hit the spirit world at all. So, so there's been many people that I've known who have been mediums on earth, highly developed so-called esoteric knowledge. You've heard of ones like Madame Blatsky and ones like that who lived in the 18th century, 19th centuries, who, who highly developed in terms of mediumship, really clear mediums. When they passed into the spirit world, they had huge amounts of trouble coming to terms with what development was really about. Because they believed it was about all this esoteric knowledge, yeah. when in reality it's about love. Yeah. Right? And so because of their, their, their beliefs not conforming to the laws of the universe, they often got stuck in the first, second or third sphere for many, many years, not progressing because of their very, very fixed ideas of what progression was all about. I've had, have talked to many mediums who have passed who had the first seven to ten years of their passing quite traumatic because what they believed the spirit world to be was totally different to what, they, what it was for them. Now if a person is getting, say, waves of, of love coming into them, yep. yep. where is that coming from? And it's coming usually from two sources. It's either going to come from God or from spirits who are with you who are giving you their love. And many spirits do this because they love you, of course. <laughs> like, so, so here's you on the earth, um, so sorry, dress, dress for yourself. And uh, yeah, mind your trousers sometimes. But uh, you have a spirit guide or spirit friends in the spirit world, and many times they will feel a feeling of love towards you. And if you're open to feeling that feeling of love, you will feel it as love passing through you. So I would have presumed it was coming from the soul, but it's not actually coming from the soul. No, no, you are feeling it in your soul, which is a totally different thing from it coming from your soul. It's actually coming from the soul of another person and entering your soul, and that's why you have it as a feeling coming to you. And that's totally different than the overwhelming emotions you personally experience for others. Yeah. Right? When you have an overwhelming emotion of love towards another, they will feel it as entering their soul in the same way as the spirit having an overwhelming feeling of love for you will, will project their love towards you and you will feel it entering your soul. Yeah. So there's this common viewpoint that we have our higher self. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I feel it's total rubbish. <laughs> we are self. Right? Okay. When, when you say higher self, you're basically saying you're split in two, that you've got a higher self and a lower self. Right? But there's no such thing as a higher self or lower self. There is just your soul, which is you, yourself. Here's your soul, yourself, and it's connected to your two bodies, right? But that's yourself. That's who you are. Now, in it has some very good, high, love-based ideals. And in it, also, right at this moment, there will also be some very negative, erroneous, and damaging ideas and beliefs. In the same soul at the same time. And sometimes you will connect to the part that's got these high ideals and you'll work with that and then you'll connect with a spirit who has those same high ideals and often what we say is our higher self is actually just a spirit who is with us influencing us you know you know the old thing of you know that old um, what's it? 
kids that, you know how you've got someone whispering in your ear, who was that? Tom Thumb, wasn't it? Whispering. Or Jiminy Cricket. Jiminy Cricket, whispering in Pinocchio's ear, isn't it? Well, you could, think, you could think of our spirit friends, and by the way, not all of them are friends, because um, there's quite a lot of times some very dark spirits whispering in our ear at the same time, right? And they're whispering in our ear telling us things. And some of it's going to pass through us and connect to us based on our emotional condition. So if my emotional condition is that I'm not open to my soul, mate, and I'm very, uh, I've got some unhealed emotion about women, and I've got a negative spirit sitting on my shoulder who's got unhealed emotion about women, every woman that comes along, I'm going to check out, I'm going to take her to bed, all that kind of stuff. A lot of it will be driven not by just my own emotion, but the sympathetic emotion of the spirit is with me as well, right? Same thing. Same for somebody's carrying anger. The same goes. Angry spirit feeding your anger. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And can you tell them to clear off? Well, yes, you can tell them anything you like, <coughs> but it doesn't mean they're going to clear off, right? <laughs> it's the same as a person on here. You tell a person here to get lost, do they always get lost? No, oftentimes they don't. They get in your face even more, don't they? Away they go. So, so you can tell them anything you like. It's only when your soul condition changes yeah. that the interaction will change. That's the thing to understand. And the soul condition changings is all about your emotions. It's all about your true beliefs, your true feelings that are all emotional. They've nothing to do with your intellect. And so if you can remember that, it means that you can understand what's going on. So sometimes you're walking along and all of a sudden you hear a voice. That's not your inner voice. Most of the time, you know what it is? It's like a little spirit, a spirit sitting on your shoulder saying, I don't think you should do that. We had an instant re recently where a lady came to us and said, oh, I was going to sell my house, but then I, I was, my higher self told me that I shouldn't. I said, oh, yeah, no worries. Can we talk to your higher self? <laughs> anyway, she was quite mediumistic, and, and it was a man who was talking to her, who lived in her house before she did, who passed. And he loved the house, and he doesn't want her to sell it because she's a nice woman. So he told her not to sell it. So she's walking around. She doesn't want to live where, she, where she's got this house. She wants to live nearly 700 kilometres elsewhere. But she's still living there because she believes her higher self told her. And it was the man. We had a talk with the man. She did, and she realises now that it's not the same. Thing. We had a talk with the man, and he talked to her about... You know, he, he told her, you know when you have a look at this? Well, I, I'm telling you to do that. You know when you have a look at that? I told you to do that. And he, once we entered a dialogue with this higher self, and it came out to be a man, and then it came out to be a certain man, and someone who she can investigate who had a life on earth, she started realising that all it was was somebody in the spirit world telling her what to do. Mm. And she just accepted it because it's someone yeah. in the spirit world. You know what, like, Jesus can stand here right in front of you and tell you that he's Jesus, and you won't believe him, right? But somebody in the spirit world can come to you and tell you that they're Jesus, and you'll believe in no worries. Why is that? Well, I was <laughs> Why? He's supposed to come as a thief in the night, remember? Well, I am. Exactly right. He also said a man will come here. Then he comes on a great white horse out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think it's a lot of logic in that. Can you see that? Often, what happens? We don't trust people on earth, do we? We learn not to trust them, haven't we not? Like most of us have learned. And so, but what happens is when a spirit comes along, we think automatically that this spirit must know a lot more, must think that know better, they must be in love and all those kind of things. That's what we believe, right? But all those beliefs could be wrong. The truth is this spirit might be just another person who's willing to damage you as much as any person you've ever met on earth. And you don't know. How do you know? The only way you're going to know is by being able to feel their soul condition. If I can't feel them, I'm not going to know whether they're speaking the truth, not speaking the truth, what kind of condition they have, what kind of emotions they have. If I can't feel them, how am I going to know who I'm speaking with? This is why dealing with your emotions is so important. It's only when you deal with your emotions that you'll start to feel not only your own stuff, but everyone else's around you. And you'll be able to tell when people have a bad intention. You won't, be able to, you won't have to intellectually analyse it anymore. You'll be able to feel their intention. It, it will feel creepy, like you'll feel it. Just like when you walk into a room and you go all cold. You know sometimes that happens? 
What's going on there? Well, there's a whole heap of spirits in that room that are quite angry and upset and quite damaging and obviously you're feeling them. Right? And we learn to feel the people that connect to us, whether they're on the earth or in the spirit world, it doesn't matter where they are. If we can feel them, we know whether they're speaking the truth, not speaking the truth, whether they're telling us lies, fibs, whatever. We know. Because we can feel it now, not just intellectualise it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. so, so let yourself do that. Develop them. Experiment with that. And you don't have to believe what I'm saying. All you need to do is experiment and see whether it works. So you could say, oh, well, for six months I'll try it. Well, let's look at some of the emotions. That I, well, let's look at some of the things that are happening in my life that I don't like. You know? I haven't got much money at the moment, so let's say that's one of the issues. All right. Instead of going down intellectually, the intellectual road would be working hard and getting a second job, all that stuff, right? Instead of doing that, I'll, I'll just say, all right, let's try out what AJ is saying to me. The money, he's saying the money issue is to do with an emotion. That's what he's saying, right? So what emotion could I have? So what I do is I try to work out what emotion it is. And it could be, could be that my father had lots of money and I didn't like my father. Simple as that. Could be that. And that's preventing now me from now accepting money into my own life. Does that make sense? It could be just simple things like that. But I examine this emotionally rather than intellectually and deal with the emotion and then see what the result is. Like, you can measure that. So what I'm, what I'm saying to you, you can actually put into practice in your own life and measure the results of If it doesn't work, then don't do it anymore. Quite simple, isn't it? Like, is it like you can measure it. It's a bit like um, anything you do, isn't it? You can do it for a bit if it works. Well, good. Try it. Try some more. If it doesn't work, stop. You're allowed to do that. You know, like you don't have to follow something forever and a day. You're allowed to make different choices. My suggestion is instead of just pushing it under the carpet and saying no, no, it can't be that simple or can't. And by the way, simple and easy are not the same things. Are they? So what I'm saying to you is simple to understand, but quite often difficult to do because of the emotion. Right? It's the emotion that's got to come out of you. That's the thing that's going to change everything. So that's the part that's hard. It's quite but, often the emotion's locked, isn't it? So it's very hard to... Yeah, but remember, every time it's locked, it's because I want it to be. So there's, there's a fear I have. There's something I don't want to happen. Remember, remember the scale that I drew there, the yeah. grief, shame, fear. And, and the, the biggest issue that we, pla we face on the planet is fear. <coughs> we are not willing to acknowledge our fears. We get angry instead of getting afraid. <coughs> That's one of our biggest problems. And if we can start acknowledging our true fears, then we'll, we'll get a lot deeper. The key is to feel our way through the fear rather than just trying to intellectualise our, our fears away. You know, it's like, who's afraid of spiders? You don't have many here, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I've got two on the windows that I'm Right Now, who's afraid of coming to Australia where you've got, where you've got great big spiders like this snakes, and, snakes. and poisonous snakes, the ten most poisonous snakes in the world? Who's afraid of them? You'll feel different depending on what you've grown up with, you see. There's probably more people in Australia who are afraid of those things than there will be in New Zealand who's not grown up with those things. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because we have the multi-generational fear passed down. Mm -hmm. so fear is a big blockage to all emotion. Yeah. And it's one of the biggest problems that we face. The majority of men have huge problems acknowledging fear. The majority of women live in fear without going deeper. Do you understand the difference? Mm -hmm. like, a lot of men will ignore the fact I've got any fear at all, particularly emotionally. But the majority of women acknowledge their fears, but they often live in them. And this is where we both, both, part, both genders need to get through this fear blockages that we have and into the deeper emotions. Anyway, I'd like to thank, I think we need to finish it off there because myself and Mary need to get going. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> and it's lovely to meet all of you and uh, who knows, we might meet again soon. We don't, don't know these things, I know some of you will meet soon again. And, uh, and myself and Mary, I've enjoyed spending a bit of time with you. And oh, I just need to let you know a few things. 
if you want to know uh, more, there's a website uh, that you can download a lot of uh, things for free on. Uh, it's called, there's quite a few websites actually, but divinetruth.com. There's also a .com.au. Um, on those websites, there's a download section, and on the download section, there's a hint of MP3s. There's 200 hours of MP3s, actually, uh, about all sorts of subjects over the last three years that are that I've been doing it. And there's also, um, sorry, our mail address. If you want to go on an email list, myself and Mary don't email out very often, so you're definitely not going to get handed with emails. Probably about once every few months we send one email out. But it's office at divine truth.com. Um, and you can send uh, send your, if you want to go on an email address or something like that, where we let you know where we are. Or, but most of that happens on the website. And um, we are currently in the process of trans of changing everything around with DVDs. We are actually wanting to make every DVD available for free. Mm -hmm. So what we're doing over the coming months is actually producing every DVD for free. And it's also free postage as well. Um, so, so it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it's going to be free postage and free. And so, so if you want any DVDs, uh, what you'll eventually do is, we're, we're, we're just in the process of getting it started where you'll let people know what DVDs you want and they'll package up a package for you for free. Of course, when we run out of money, then we won't be doing it. <laughs> we won't do it at all. We won't uh, until we get more money. So that's how it works. So when we get our, when our donations come in, we just spend all of that money on doing things for free. And then when we run out of money, we stop doing things until we get more money, and then we just do other things for free. So uh, so in the end, you won't have to pay for DVDs or any of those kind of things. We're also wanting to produce a CD of all the MP3s so you don't have to download them on the internet and you can play them in an MP3 player, like a DVD MP3 player. So, and the, we don't do podcasts at the moment because to do that means that in a presentation like this we have to have a lot of technology. Just the audio. But we have the audio files which are all MP3 files downloadable. Yeah. Normally I upload them within a few days of having a talk like this but this one probably won't be uploaded for a couple of weeks. Where's your venue down on the South Island, Asia? Um, we're at a private person's home uh, at Glenorchy. Um, Christchurch. Glenorchy. Below Queenstown. Below Queenstown. Yeah. Below Queenstown. Yep. Um, you have to go to Queenstown. It's a fair to way from Christchurch. Um, yeah. Um, uh, I think the address of it's on the website. Yep. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. I had a friend in Christchurch and I told her to go, but I don't think it Yeah, it's a fair way from Christchurch. Um, yeah, the reason why it turned out to be Anglin is a friend of ours uh, lives down there and she's the one who's, who's wanted to have it at her house. And she's happy to have people camp overnight. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and that's, uh, it's about 60, 60 k's from south of Queenstown, isn't it? Or south, it's really it's more, it's more west of Queenstown. Yeah, so you have to go through Queenstown to get there. Um, anything else you wanted to know about? No, no, that's something separate, but we don't have anything to do with that. Um, there's a group of people in Australia that, uh, that have actually set up a place where people can go and do emotional processing work, but we don't personally, myself and Mary don't personally have anything to do with that aside from visiting occasionally. So, um, um, have any plans in coming back to um, Not at this point, because we're our next uh, we're going to spend three months in this, uh, in Australia again. Um, Mary's got a series of emotional workshops that she's doing in the next three months, um, and that'll take us through to June. And then it looks like we'll be going uh, to US, um, England, Europe uh, to visit a fair few people over there um, for a period of two to three months. Who knows, we might be able to come on the way back yes. or something like that, or on the way over, we haven't yeah. thought of that. But, yeah. Maybe next year. Yeah. But what we try to do is get to places overseas at least once a year. Um, eventually what's going to happen though is people like yourself will 
you know, I know you're pretty connected emotionally and you're doing with your emotions pretty well. And that having people like that in a in a certain location helps a lot because you you can help a lot of people uh, through that, and often that then causes a law of attraction on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So we re myself and Mary respond to demand totally, pretty much. Um, so no, rather than demand. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> When I say demand, it's in a very loose sense. So yeah. If someone demands of us, we rarely go. But if someone <laughs> desires us to go, then we yeah. So you respond to desire. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So um, they're, uh, they're most of the things. Oh, there's also on the website a heap of printed material, which is not just about the divine love part. There's a heap of printed, channel printed material available for free that you can download. You can actually print it up, the PDFs that you can take along to an office works, so I don't know if you have them over here or something similar, you know, where you can get it printed. Um, all of the material that's available on our site uh, is all copy, free of copyright and can be copied and distributed to anybody, including the DVDs. So, so it's okay if one of you gets a whole group of DVDs and then sends it off to somebody else or whatever, and um, we're happy for all of that to occur. And the, all of the downloads available on the website, the text downloads, are uh, very, there's a mixture of channeled material. There's about, probably about five to 10,000 pages of channeled material. Uh, about 5,000 pages of it relate to the divine love part, and about 5,000 pages of it relate to the natural love part of spirits in the spirit world who have channeled <coughs> material to earth about both of those parts. So there's plenty of stuff to read if you want to read the material as well. And all of it's available on those websites. There are two different websites, by the way, but we try to make them identical. So if one doesn't work, try the other one. What's the little symbol? .com.au. Yeah, yeah. There's also a divinetruth.biz as well, and .us, and a few others that we've got. That, but those two are the ones that... Uh, that we're using. And there are different sites that we try to keep the same material on, but if something doesn't work in one site, try the other site. We've recently had to change over our sites because we were getting 40 gigs of downloads every month. Uh, so, And it's growing every month. So, so now there's so many downloads a month we had to go to an unlimited download site. And there's not many of those available in Australia, so we had to go overseas to do that. Um, can I just mention something just before it really moves? So some of the people who emailed me who are familiar with the Divine Love Park wanted to link together, and you might not necessarily know each other. So those people who emailed me, you could just perhaps come over to the kitchen after everybody goes so that you can all meet each other because I know that you will want to have connections. Okay? So I'm not sure who the, some of the people are myself. No worries. And I'd, yeah, I'd like to thank Nari for organising all of this for us. And we have to ask you too about the venue hire and how much that That's costs. fine, that's all we thank you. Is it? Yeah. Thank you very much. So thank you for that donation. It's been lovely meeting you all. Great to have you. We're looking forward to our little excursion now down south. <laughs> 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 I won't let that out.